Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. Oh, my goodness, it's Friday. It's Friday, James. That's James McKay. He's with Amoresco. He is a, an energy um, energy solution partner. Yep. With uh, Amoresco, which is a national company. National company. Uh, some what, 1,100 people involved? About that now. Yeah. So, like all energy companies, growing pretty quickly. It's a busy time in, in the world. And your beat is here in, in Hawaii. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've been in Hawaii nearly seven years now. Yeah. Um, I'm the, the basically the business uh, d development manager for the Hawaii region. Uh -huh. So I report up to the, the manager in the, the, the west coast out of Seattle. So uh, Amoresco have been doing business in Hawaii for probably five or six years. Kind of, I think now we we've, we've as a company have found out we made the mistake of trying to manage the business from the east coast out of Boston, which for a few reasons. With Hawaii, you can't do that. Yeah, it's uh, been a very painful learning lesson. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm put more doing damage control than business development yeah, okay. right now. So, my role is to kind of go back and look at the projects we've done, sort of pick up the the open and items that I, I'm not really that satisfied, nor the client, yeah. and just sort of get them fixed up in the most expedient way possible. What kind of projects has Amoresco done? Hawaii. So the biggest project we've had was with the state of Hawaii. Uh, it's the Dep Department of Accounting and, and General Services, so known as DAGS. Uh, it's just opposite the road from the state capital, so their, their headquarters is obviously high profile, and they're actually the landlord for all the, or most of the state buildings. So you know, you talk about the entities like Department of Health, which obviously is a critical service within the state. That they're focusing on their own mission of what they should be doing, and the the, the landlord tenant responsibilities is really under DAGs. Uh -huh. So they they own and operate the facilities on behalf of the state. And what, what Amoresco did as a, uh, an ESCO is the acronym, an ESCO, Energy Services Company. Uh, th there are big companies that have, a, a, it's a very powerful and potentially very both profitable and equitable relationship between the client, which in this case would be DAGS with the state, and our company, which is kind of the general contractor for a big, I call it like an energy umbrella. So the energy solutions company competes in a deal which is called an energy solutions contract. And, it, and it's usually a performance contract. So it's an energy solutions performance contract, ESPC. So to show metrics in order to get paid? Yeah, generally, it, you know, like any contract, the devil's in the details, as you know. As an attorney, there's a lot of words in those contracts, and a lot of words can change the impact of those contracts. Sure, economically. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big sort of expedient way to get a, a big project going faster than you might have done with a piecemeal project. Because the key things are a couple of things. It's performance-based, which I think is critical. Um, and so the, the client is actually not putting any money on the line. That's the, the key point. So a lot of the, the projects that we see in Hawaii uh, are to address what's called deferred maintenance. So buildings that have a lot of infrastructure, but they just haven't been keeping up with things like air conditioning. And you know, you've got a unit that's there, it's working, but it's definitely not working. Very inefficient. Technology is changing so quickly, yeah. especially with lights, you know, solar PD. That, 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 that the technology in solar hasn't changed expediently as much as LEDs and air conditioning and other pumps and motors and stuff. But if you just have a widget that you've bought 20 years ago and you think it's working, it's, it's drawing a lot more energy than it should be in today's modern world and the way technology is changing. So we sort of take the approach that that's under the label of deferred maintenance. So it's, it's maintenance that should have been done on that equipment usually a lot earlier than when we review it. So it's a whole bunch of things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, we, and what's, the, what's the principal metric that uh, we, Amoresco, have helped DAGs by what? Reducing costs of operating the building, or yep. it's reducing usually, energy costs usually, of operating the building. Reducing of kilowatt hours, but obviously, you know, when you look at something like, even though we didn't do uh, lighting in an LED technology, we just upgraded the fluorescent tubes. Is is what I've sort of seen so far. Um, Things that when we address the energy side of it can also have uh, ancillary positive, positive benefits on the operation side of it. Say, for example, LEDs that last a lot longer than other types of bulbs, especially like in a big warehouse where you're looking at getting a, a giant sort of crane up there to change out lights and when they fail. Or a small studio. 
Well, yeah, this one you probably should be able to do this yourself pretty easily. But like, you know, I, I consulted for a couple of years at Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and they've got big hangars there. That, sure, you know, yeah. And, you, and there, you know, the guys are working on old lights that are failing, and therefore the light quality in our older technologies, the light quality decreases as the light ages. An LED is usually like a binary, it works or it doesn't. It doesn't usually decrease a lot. So the problem you get in that kind of thing is where the facility guy is like, okay, I don't have that much money. This light still kind of works. It looks okay. We, we can put the money further. somewhere else. We, yeah, we'll just wait until it breaks. Yeah. But meanwhile, the mechanic that's working on a helicopter can't, can't really see what he's doing. They, they usually have to wear headlamps anyway. But you know, it's not the ideal situation. So the, the energy services procurement contract comes in and says, all right, you've got, let's say, you know, UH Manoa is a case study. I hate to kind of dig on them, but they're upwards of over half a billion dollars with a B in deferred maintenance in, in just that one campus alone. So, you know, we don't... that was a headline not too long ago. Yeah, it's, it's a big headline. It's one that should be taken very seriously, I, I think. And, you yeah, know, that can really be related to transportation as well because that's... The, the infrastructure that we could be upgrading could also rapidly accelerate, pun intended, the clean energy transition of Hawaii's sort of transportation sure, sure. suite. So, You've got to be smart to do it. Um, You've got to be a, a risk taker. Amoresco is doing this kind of, this format all over, you know, uh, the country, I take it. Yep, I mean, yep, yep, yep. In other words, we'll save you money. We're not going to get paid unless we save you money. And, yep. our, and our, pay, our, our, our compensation is based on how much we save you. Yeah, it's an agreed, it's a joint shared energy savings plan, which is guaranteed uh -huh. by the measures that we install. So mm -hmm. we do a big order to the facilities. We address what's called an energy savings measure, an energy conservation measure is usually the, this. You know, these in, as energy, you know, is full of acronyms, right? So yeah, it's it like yeah. energy conservation measure and ECM. So there's a giant spreadsheet that sort of addresses what do we have today, what should be there tomorrow, the savings, and then we work out how, when we put up all the money to upgrade your facilities, how do we get paid back so, you know, we don't go out of business and lose everything, right. but you guys get an upgraded facility at our cost. you, you got to be smart. you yeah. got to be able to look around the corner. It's, are it's, you managing these contracts? or When you say developer, are you... Are you um, negotiating in the first place or are you managing them in the second place? Uh, it would be a bit of both. I've only been there not even quite nine months yet. So I, I was in, uh, originally moved to Hawaii for the solar energy industry and worked in a lot of uh, capacities. So you had industry. experience in solar and energy, renewable energy before you even came? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think that's what critical. What are you doing in Australia? I can't remember. Uh, no, I moved from Arizona, actually. Yeah, Arizona. Ironically, the Valley of the Sun. Phoenix, you have an Arizona, Arizona. accent, James. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's, it's a little hard to understand. I understand. But, uh, I thought that they were going to put subtitles up, but I haven't oh, seen so, any okay. yet. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, no, I, I actually worked out, worked for the first solar company in America. Uh, it's uh, AEE Solar, founded by a brilliant yeah. guy called yeah. David Katz. Yeah. And so he yeah. started solar in the 70s. He was actually the first person that bought a solar module to implement and Ironically, where Hawaii is now was actually for the marijuana industry in Humboldt County because there were a lot of these oh, off-grid silties. So, so yeah, the, the off-grid growing places were driving up and down to get car batteries to power their little cabins in, in the hills to grow pot. And, and David being a really, really smart guy, and he was a nuclear physicist and just didn't want to work for the Navy. He wanted to do something useful with his life. He thought, you know, that's not my kuleana to travel the world and do that stuff. So he left and he found his path just through the money in the sort of cash industry of growing marijuana and then created the first off-grid system to help refuel these batteries because he was too lazy to go down and get new batteries in Humboldt County. So, but he, he's a very ethical guy. Uh, I learned a lot from him and most importantly I learned uh, the most important thing about the solar industry is we shouldn't just be plowing on more modules in the generation. You want to optimize your energy load. So you actually minimize your energy usage first and the best solar install is the smallest install for that site. So the biggest mistake I've seen in Hawaii, which is quite a sad one, is where a solar company comes in and just sees a giant roof and says, oh, well, let's fill up this roof with solar modules, go sign here. And people are like, oh, that'd be great, sign it off. Yeah. And usually in the agreement that we have with the utility when we go to interconnect, the customer doesn't get any benefit to the over generation. So it's going back to the utility's grid and they're just going to sell your energy to your neighbor at their profit. Yeah. So, but you've made the investment. 
Yeah, if you bought it, yeah, yeah. So you know, the the, the solar companies that do it on a third party agreement where it's a power purchase agreement will never do that because they know yeah. that they're not going to get the money back. So yeah. you know, it's a complicated industry, but as you say, key, key planning is, is critical, and that's. Where we do it now is that we've been doing kind of the, the bread and butter of the ESCO world of facilities and upgrading things. And so as Hawaii's set our ambitious goal for 2040, the 100% the renewable, we've now got a aligning transportation goal of trying to get clean renewable energy into the transportation sector, which is very ambitious as well. So let me reel it back, just one, one thought about you know the, the, the concept in general. It sounds like this is a kind of uh, aftermarket. In other words, the low-hanging fruit was the guy wants to cover his roof with solar. That's the low-hanging fruit. He'll sign anything. Somebody gives him a spreadsheet, you know, and he'll, he'll buy it. Um, <clears throat> but the secondary aspect of that is um, we're, we're going to do a more refined analysis on you. Um, we're going to cut this, this baby more carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to look for efficiency. We're not going to oversell you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to find out exactly what you need, exactly what will work best, and then we, we're going to put our brain cells on that yep. and give you a, a project that is really suited for you Absolutely. In, instead of uh, you know, overselling you. And I think it's an important point to make, is that's where we are in the continuum uh, of planning, selling, developing solar, at least solar panels in the state. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And that's kind of where I've been well suited for it now that um, when I, it, got, it, had, it got harder to sell solar systems, so a lot of solar companies did struggle sort of starting about five years ago maybe and so the the commission structure that unfortunately the solar companies were on incentivized the increased bigger selling the of better. more bigger the better because higher the commission you know essentially by me selling solar the right way by look talking about their lights and their air conditioning and people are like i thought you were the solar guy and i'm like no no this is important that it reduced my commission which obviously my bosses weren't happy with but that's the right way to do it. So yeah. this this evolution now has come to where you're looking at a facility, it, it has to factor in everything. And then bigger picture scale out from that one client or organization to Hawaii. Yeah. We have to look at how how, do, how does where we're moving with all this clean we're energy stuff. We're not getting to 100% until we start thinking like this. Absolutely. Okay, and, and to your credit, you do, and Amoresco mm -hmm. does, and that's where you are. Now, the, you know, the big question, and it's a hard one for me because I don't have an answer. I do not know what your answer is going to be on this. How do you take that kind of thinking you know, and apply to transportation, not easy. How do you do mm. that? Yeah, it's it's a, well, it is a challenge, and um, I've just just found out it's unfortunately more of a challenge than I hoped it was going to be. <laughs> so this, uh, the city county of Honolulu now is now I think just about to end their first month long trial of their first electric bus here, which was donated by a company. Well, not donated; it's on loan. Unfortunately, it would be great if they just gave it to us. But um, you know, they're sort of seven eight hundred thousand dollars for one bus, which sounds like a lot. But I think the guy who was there at the Oahu Transportation Services said the average bus is, you know, six, 600 grand anyway. That would so be John uh, no, Uchi. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, number two in DTS. Right. Yeah, so, you know, it's great to see them moving that way, but we have a lot more buses, and the... The thing is that people think, you know, I'm going to go green on the consumer side, residential. You know, I'm going to buy a Tesla. That, that, that's great. And they, if you're just plugging into the grid, mm -hmm. essentially you're not guaranteed to be filling it from renewable energy anyway. You need to have that renewable energy supply. So I'm, I'm proud that the state's moving towards clean transportation. But in my mind, where the ideal solar system generating power is where the load or where the demand is going to be. So as soon as I heard this, I'm like, okay, well, if all the buses are just going to plug into a grid that is still owned and operated by HECO, and they're not rapidly ramping out their renewable energy supply, we've got to kind of look at a model where maybe we look at a giant solar canopy where the buses are parked at night and where the buses are on their routes or routes, depends where you come from, and you can, you can have them plug in just even rapidly to charge while they're waiting. And there's a couple of benefits that the utility would get from that is, is that, you know, if in partnership, they can also partner into this deal, but also the buses are essentially like giant moving batteries. And the batteries are good for electrical issues on the grid. Like if there's spikes and oversupply of solar, the solar energy, instead of kind of being wasted or in other islands, they're actually being run to ground. It's actually wasting that extra generation. Yeah. That could be used to, instead of dump it to ground and waste it, you know, if the bus is parked for five minutes, jump, dump it into that battery for Charge the bus. Charge them wherever you can find them. Absolutely. So we're going to, you know, the longer vision, we've got all these moving batteries running around Oahu, 
this a bunch of solar it's generation. Moving, oh, yeah. So yeah, mobile battery. Mobile battery. That's just, it's, it's, it's called vehicle to grid. So it's using the vehicle to charge the grid and vice versa. And, and who makes these? The same company as the bus? That's the Achilles Hill. I've just kind of found out. So I, I vis visited with Proterra, who's out in Oakland, and I've been talking to BYD. So they're the big two companies. Proterra is kind of like an American-grown company. BYD started in China. They've set up shop in, in, in LA. LA. They're slightly different models. So the one that the city counties just started with is the Proterra model. BYD is coming in very shortly after mm -hmm. for another month. So they're going to test them. Uh, what I was hoping for was that they'd already had, here's your business plan for putting in these giant parking structures. Here's maybe the extra storage you need on those sites. And here's the fast charges that you can rapidly charge all our buses and go in and out. But they're focused on the bus themselves, not that part of it yet. Well, when we come back from this break, I want to I want to tell you my my vision, mm. and then I'd like you to try to shoot it down. Love it. Okay. I'm sure you'll have a good time. Oh, great. <laughs> That's James McKay. He always has a good time. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're alive. I told you we'd come back. We came back. I told you. We did. <laughs> James McKay, Amoresco, um, a, an energy um, uh, solution uh, partner and uh, trying to develop um, these efficiency concepts around uh, renewable energy um, for all kinds of things in Hawaii. Yep. Um, so let me, let me offer you a model and you can tell me. I mean, I agree. We absolutely have to fix the bus system. Um, buses are a great prospect. Buses can move lots of people. Buses can take cars off, off the highway. Not for everybody. Not for the you know, small contractor who has to have his kit in his truck. You can't take him off the right. highway. Yeah. Um, but for most people, commuters, are, of course, buses. We got a lot of buses. Everybody says we got a great bus system, okay? Most of those buses, except this one temporary, you know, experimental electric bus mm -hmm. are fossil fuel buses. Yep. And they work fine. Everybody likes them, you know. Um, they have to pay a little, but there are some, some people who are entitled to a discount and all this. Um, you know, like retired people can, can buy, a, you know, $35 annual bus pass. Economy. Yeah, that's great. It's not so yeah. good if you're a cyclist behind one. Yeah, like well, that's, that. a, that's another issue. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's didn't a, write okay. here. Okay, yeah. and then, you know, so we gotta, we gotta keep, keep uh, our eye on the air. <clears throat> but let me let me give you my model, okay? Mm -hmm. um, an ordinary bus costs a lot less than seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the electric cost of the electric bus. Mm -hmm. And to re refleet, uh, you know, the bus system in Oahu or anywhere else at seven fifty a pop is going to cost a lot of money, and there's a lot of resistance because Hawaii is not in great shape financially, yep. you know. And there's all kinds of issues about financing that kind of expense. If I need, well, I don't know what five hundred buses, yeah, it's going to cost close, me a fortune, billions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So how about getting 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 real in terms of the existing assets, using the existing assets and systems and mechanics and workshops, you know, that you use to maintain it, but and getting more fossil fuel buses, but loading the highway up with them, loading the highway up. You know, so if I live in Mililani, I'm not going to drive my car if I can get on a bus, and the bus is free. Now, this happened on a big island mm. a few years ago, be before Billy Kenroy. There was, a, there was a bus system that went from Hilo to Kona for free, and if you worked in the hotels, this is ideal. You don't have to drive your car, spend the gas, you know, clog up the highway. Um, and for that matter, take the risk of falling asleep at the wheel after a long shift in a hotel. 
Right? Um, so um, um, that was that was very successful. Everybody loved it, and it, it was it was beautiful. Um, you can do that. Of course, it's a financing issue also. But if I bought 500 buses and I loaded the streets and the freeway up with these buses and I made them cheap or free, I'd have everybody in the bus, mostly aside from the small contractors. I'd have everybody in the bus, everybody riding the bus, nobody driving, congestion dramatically reduced, and what what quality of life, you know what I have. And I could get on a bus any minute. And furthermore, and this is where we get ethnic, furthermore, I could create a, a variable Melbourne. Remember Melbourne? Uh, yeah, I okay. was there, there recently. recently is the, C, the CDB, the Central Business CBD? Central there. Business District, yeah. Eight, eight, eight blocks by eight blocks, trams all the way through at yeah. grade level, right, yeah. for free. Yeah. You can get anywhere you want. The result is the place is bustling with business, with restaurants and shops and offices. It's just unbelievable what happens when you make free transportation. We can follow that model. All the CBD, the Central Business District in, in, in Oahu would be loaded with new business because there wouldn't be a park issue just get on the tram or yeah. the bus as a case may be now grant you okay it's not renewable energy maybe you get efficient buses for a, a few bucks more it's not it's not the you know the dream of electric electric buses but in terms of the result you get reduction in, in, in uh, fossil fuel I mean reduction in, uh, in congestion um, you, you get new business um, you get people having a quality of life where they can do their, you know, their cell phone activity while they're on the yeah, bus totally. instead of the being important stuff. You know, tweet, not even able to make a call while yeah. they're driving. Um, yeah. And so, you know, everybody wins. Now, maybe that's not phase two or three or four. Maybe it's just phase one, but it goes somewhere. Now, the challenge I see for that is you gotta you gotta find the money to buy the buses and you gotta find the money to make the buses cheap or free. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a step transaction kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in that direction, in the space of five years or no more, um, or maybe a little more, we, we would be able to change the way transportation works in Oahu. Absolutely. And get everybody on the bus. And I would get on the bus myself, and yeah. you probably would too. If it was free, you know, that's that's uh, uh, that's your idea, I guess. And it's not patented yet. You don't have the set up. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, lo I love the model. I think it's it's awesome. And I actually didn't know about the Big Island one, so I'd like to learn more about that. You know, I think it's interesting when you have a model like that uh, to look at why it doesn't exist anymore, obviously. So that, that's an important one. You know, obviously, someone in the Big Island killed that program for a reason. And to sort of go back to that. Well, I think it must have been financial, because it was free. Yeah, Anything that's but, free is a target. It's like low-hanging fruit. It's, right. It's like, let's get that for the general fund. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's the wrong vision, right? That you, it, that, that's where I think we have enough money on this planet to solve every problem that we have on this planet. It's just how you apply that money, and having the right people in power to move the money to where it needs to be. So I think that's the first thing I'd go to. I'd love to learn more about that program. I, I love your idea. I actually was not at all a, a supporter of rail uh, when it was launched. And just the concept of just where it was and how it was going to work, it just to me didn't seem to make sense for Hawaii. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too late now to sort of stop that. It's, we're way indebted with, with that project. But uh, I, when in the initial hearings for that project, um, there was a guy who testified, I think, uh, some model in Brazil. And their model was the extended buses, dedicated lanes in the highways, and that, that's all you could do in that lane. And it was a very, I don't think it was free, but it was very cheap, extremely affordable, you know, 10 cents a ride or something. So I, I think that's a great model. And actually also to go back to the whole renewable thing, you know, I don't have much focus in my life in any sphere, so I'm kind of good at looking at opportunities and connecting dots. So as soon as you said it's not renewable, I'm just like, well, you know, it, it should and could be renewable. So we, we have a great local company here, Pacific Biodiesel, right? So why not have a mandate and help them scale up and other, other companies that can produce biofuels? We've got a great energy or now elemental accelerator company, Terra Viva, that's growing crops that are going to be crushed for oil. And now they've launched their partnership much more with Kamehameha schools and using unused land. And that's not a feedstock. So they could be planting that in very compromised land that has you know, toxic chemicals and pesticides where people don't want to grow kale and lettuce and whatever. <laughs> they could be growing your bus biofuel. So there's no reason why this shouldn't, oh, yeah, shouldn't be local fuel. Very good point. So that would not be hard to do. Absolutely. Well, it's not going to be easy to do, but it's but, something but we should we, be looking at. We have at. a system. Yeah, you know, we, we can do it. Biodiesel uh, actually 
you know, works, yep. and they are providing biofuel Absolutely. through the airport and yep. to other state yep. facilities yep. Um, and, and private interests, and so you could, you could do that. Yep. And that could be like phase 1A. One, one yep. And phase 1B, by the way, might be that as you retire the fossil fuel buses, you bring in more renewable type buses, whether it's biofuel buses uh, or, or actually uh, fossil fuel and biofuel is the same kind of bus, really. Yeah, you can uh, run, most diesel buses will run on biodiesel without yeah, much of a tweak, a and problem. I'm definitely not an expert in that area. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I think it's workable. Are, I mean, it's, yeah. it's not a big deal to convert them. Yep. Um, and so then you can start bringing in electric buses as the technology gets better, as the price you know comes down. And the important thing is you are you have already achieved public acceptance of the bus as a way to commute, totally. as a way to get around, yep. as a way to do the grid in the yep. central business district. So you you will have achieved a big change in conduct, and then you can start. Spending the extra money. I love the idea. I think it's a great idea. And you know, you, uh, any commuter now on the H1 is just looking around. Well, I, I know I do. Just one person, one person, one person, one person. I'm just like, this is insane. Absolutely insane. Yeah. And all, uh, you know, just even when I first moved to the States you know, a long time ago, flying over LA, just seeing all the cars sitting there just for, in traffic. It's just, I just think, wow, how much oil is getting burnt now? Now. Now, and it's insane. So I think, we I think that to, every time I drive, honestly. Yeah, and you know, like you say, it, it's a terrible quality, quality of life. Like, when, when, if, if people did catch a bus, you, it's not just that you can do other stuff. Like, people are on their phones, unfortunately, anyway, when they drive. <laughs> Bad news. It's yeah. terrible, right? So there's a health and safety thing. There's a quality of life. There's your whole attention span. There's the stress level. It's like riding a bus, if it's convenient and affordable, is a, is a, a huge improvement, not just to the environmental side of the state, but the, yeah. the economics, the whole is livability. Is this something Amoresco could get involved in? Uh, well, I've been told we'll never be the first into anything, but we hope to be the second if it's a good idea. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a good line. I don't know if I made it up, but it's something like that. So, you know, uh, we, we, there's, an, there's an ownership model. It's where we'll, we'll design, build, own, operate, maintain. So it's D-boom, where, you know, something like an electric bus system would be a bit out of our purview right now, but there's no reason why finding the right financing partners that have the same vision, you know, we've got... Mark from Facebook, Zuckerberg, he might love that idea and say, hey, You're I just saw Jay's right. show. This is a great idea. I'd like to start this you know, company. And as we go down the pike here in this country, not only in Hawaii, in this country, we find that government is unable to raise the money to do the traditional infrastructure things. Yep. Can't raise the money. Yep. And what do you do when you reach that problem? And you don't you know, strap everybody for the next 50 years. What you do is you bring you know, business in. You bring private investment in. Yep. You bring industry in to help solve the problem. That's happening more and more. Yep. You'll see it's happening with Healthcare. It's happening with healthcare. Right, right, right. right. So uh, this is this is really an insoluble problem. And uh, if if you could connect up with with business, um, they might help fund it. You know, they find a way. Amoresco could pencil it out, couldn't yep, it? Yep, yep. Find oh, a way to make it profitable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the th key thing is, you know, I look at like say, you know, the, the uber wealthy. So I, I actually have reached out to Mark Zuckerberg. I didn't quite connect, but I'm still kind of working <laughs> on that. If anyone knows, I'd appreciate the lead. Um, you know, Oprah has landed in, in Maui. So these people that come to Hawaii for the reasons of just the sheer beauty and natural paradise that Hawaii is. So I'm like, well, you know, they've got some vested interest here. Instead of creating foundations that are giving money around to the rest of the, rest of the world, why not build a feasible and really good business model in the state that they obviously love so much to come and invest here? Like, to me, it's just a no-brainer. I wish I was a billionaire. I'd be a great billionaire. But, um, <laughs> last question, James. Yeah. Last question. It's the ghost of Christmas future. Mm. It's Charles Dickens, okay? I'm going to give you a world here in Hawaii where, on this issue, on you know congestion and public transportation and transportation in general, ground transportation, uh, where we do nothing, we just turn our backs on it. We we kick the ran per, the, ran, the can per, perpetually down the road, and uh, we get all locked up in a failure of consensus or leadership. What happens to us then? I'd just like to know your thoughts. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question too, because to me that was also tied with the development we've got going on here, like Ho'opili, the development that's that's grown and that's going to kind of build up the south shore of Oahu. And um, yeah, it's not a lifestyle I want to see. Uh, it's scary to me personally, it, like having more cars and more people in less density and just sort of more sprawl. Uh, I know we're going high rise, but just, you know, ultimately population is the biggest issue. Just more people coming to an island, even a giant island like Australia, 
continent, it, you know, at some point you have a, a, a carrying capacity. There's definitely a quality of life issue, which is kind of why I'm into the sustainability thing, because I think where we're heading as a species and a planet is a scary place. So I think we, we can't be at all apathetic about where we are today and where we should be focusing on a positive, positive vision tomorrow, because we're already seeing the impacts of where we could be if we don't take serious and rapid yeah, action. Yeah. yeah. James McKay, Emma Resco, an energy solutions partner, also a thinker. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, James. Appreciate the time. Happy Aloha Friday. <laughs>